The Conquest of Bliss, a podcast about finding light in the darkness. This episode was produced by Cavi Productions. Hello and welcome back to The Conquest of Bliss. I am here with Evans Explosion. How are you today, Evan? Z Evans. Oh, <laughs> I'm feeling good. <laughs> Just Evan is fine. Okay, perfect. Perfect. I really like your hat. Um, I know that no one can see it, so... That was a useless comment. Anyways, I <laughs> um, Evan is here to talk to me about anti-prohibitionism and how prohibitionism can be extremely problematic for people who want to get clean. And in lieu of prohibition, education is a much better, in my opinion, and also Evan's, um, much better alternative. So I guess I'll start by asking, what led you here? Like, why? why is this something that you're passionate about? Um, for myself, um, I'm someone who has, be, because I'm in the music industry, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, drugs are something that are really, you know, just everywhere. I think really in almost any walk of life, they really are everywhere. So um, I, I've noticed that, you know, some people just don't, just don't deal with them the same way as, as others do. So for some people, it's not just getting sober, and like that's like the one answer that that, that solves everything. So, mm -hmm. yeah, personally, um, and you can let me know if you agree or disagree. But personally, I think that drugs are a lot like any other tool. Like just because you can use a hammer to kill someone or kill yourself doesn't mean that we should prohibit people from owning hammers. You know, I think that they fall into the category of a tool that can be very, very helpful. And unfortunately, they get painted with this evil brush when really it's the behavior around it that's dangerous. Absolutely. I always say, you know, some people just give drugs a bad name. You know, they really do. <laughs> yeah. So, like, I, I personally have some experience with addiction. Do you as well? Oh, yes. A lot of experience. All right. All right. So, because when I look back at my own addic addiction experiences, I think... If I had been properly educated, instead of, you know, the whole drug abuse resistance education thing and told that drugs are bad or, you know, like if, if I had been properly educated, I think that I would have stood a chance against addiction. But my understanding of drugs was such that they were either good or bad. You know, people said they were bad, but they clearly felt really good. And so did you did you have a similar experience where that lack of education ended up slapping you in the face? Well, um, I think that it's something that like, okay, if if you've seen like the recent like Demi Lovato documentary, um, she is on this type of like mind frame where basically it's like, okay, if if you're gonna do drugs, then you need to do it like to the extreme. So you need to be, you know, smoking crack with your heroin, basically. Um, and I think that like lots of people who do drugs initially have this type of mindset. And yes, I definitely did. So when I first started doing like Coke, let's say when I was like 16 years old, I would always have to do it until it was gone. And, and it was just this, this like mental, you know, frame of, frame of mind that said that, okay, if I'm doing this, I got to do it to the extreme. And then I also have to be destructive because that's what someone who, who, someone who does drugs you. does. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So do you have like sort of, a picture in your mind in what an education focused instead of prohibition focused program might look like in the United States or Canada? I've actually been kind of uh, graphing one recently <laughs> um, just because, uh, yeah, because I, I think that it's something that is really needed because just like you said, I mean, the whole resistance against drugs, it just has been proven that it, that, that it, it just doesn't work. It really doesn't. Well, and, and um, resistance. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just saying, and then, um, uh, sorry, I just uh, <laughs> lost my train of thought. But yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry about that. I was just going to say that resistance often creates more interest than not. Exactly, exactly. Because yep. it's just like an, another way to like rebel too as well, you know? Mm -hmm. It like glamorizes it in, in that sense. Yeah, like um, I know most of the people that I know have the experience that they're taught that it's really, really bad and that there's nothing ever beneficial about it. And then you get to an age where you start to be curious and critically thinking and going, if that's true, then why do why does addiction exist? You know, if if it's true that there's no benefits, why would so many otherwise 
healthy, smart people partake. Right. And I think that when we first start doing drugs, I mean, it's a really innocent thing, you know, because who doesn't want to be able to control how they feel and, you know, feel good all the time. You know, that's, that's a pretty, you know, reasonable, you know, want, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I I believe. Um, But it's just that when like the other behaviors, you know, that are associated with it, like for instance, like, you know, the stealing, the lying, you know what I mean? That's when it actually becomes a problem. But initially it's just a matter of wanting to, you know, help one's frame of mind, which, you know, Who wouldn't want that? Well, and I think what's really, really interesting is that like most drugs that are considered to be bad with the exception off the top of my head um, of crack, and it's really a derivative of another drug, is most of them have medicinal benefits of some kind, either physical or mental medicinal benefits. I mean, there's so much, you know, ketamine assisted therapy, psilocybin assisted therapy, LSD assisted therapy being being experimented by our governments right now and then you look at cocaine like lidocaine and novocaine and solar cane and all those canes are derived from those from from originally cocaine being used as a topical to to create like for the anesthetic effect but we don't have access to any of that unfortunately because because people have really bought into the idea that that the substances themselves are somehow evil You're absolutely right. And what's crazy is that um, when it comes to just like you said, like to like different types of, you know, drugs is that most people think that if they're given from a doctor, they're okay, you know, Mm -hmm. but but if they're done in, in, in like the real form, then, you know, automatically they're bad. They need to be, you know, locked up. And it's, uh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I, uh, I had a peer recently, or I don't know, I, someone I was speaking with, recently talking about how they ended up getting addicted to opiates um, via their doctor and then their doctor called them a drug addict and i think that that's often what happens is it's it's a bit of a trap where they give you substances to relieve pain without much education you know they might say they're addictive which doesn't really mean anything on its own i mean video games are addictive too right right And then by the time someone has become consumed by that addiction because of the lack of education, they're judged for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So your, your passion around this, um, like where, where is it? Like I said, so I guess my question, my real question would be like, what does that look like a a world that's education based and, and what are some steps that people might actually be able to do to get there? So this kind of goes back to um, really, this all started for me back to, uh, back to, at the end of 2019. It okay. was right when, um, it was when Juice World had actually died. And, um, you know, Juice World, you know, he, he was 21 years old when he overdosed. And um, of course, celebrities is this, overdosing. Is oh, he yes. a rapper? Um, he's a singer, rapper. He okay. he was yes. He had a huge hit with um his song "Lucid Dreams," in um in 2018. So he he just turned 21. He was um I don't know um I guess I guess maybe you or maybe your your uh your audience hasn't heard the story. But basically, what happened is that he was celebrating his 21st birthday. He had um got stopped at the um airport in Chicago. And uh, someone had basically um, gave, gave 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 the police a tip that um, that there was drugs on the plane. Okay. So when they came to go search his little private jet, he ended up swallowing all of his Percocet oh that he had. Oh my god! And of course, the nurse on on hand, they um, because all of a sudden he started convulsing. So then they started thinking that like, okay, he's on um, fentanyl. They thought. So what do they do? They gave him Narcan mm-hmm. when really they should have been pumping his stomach. And sure enough. He ended up dying because of it. And um, I believe that if the safe substance use education plan was in effect, that, you know, that like it could have been avoided because Mm -hmm. some of the, the way that I break down this program is basically it's for, it's it's with drug accountability and also letting somebody know what you're on. I think that's important. And also drug knowledge, knowing what you're doing and, um, you know, being, being accountable for your actions when you're, you know, on the drugs. So, um, if he would have let somebody know what he was on, I feel like then somebody could have known what proper steps to do to actually, you know, save his life. Um, 
So I think that that would be one part of the program that is very necessary. You know, I know that, you know, most of us, when we do drugs, we don't want to let people know about them, but I figure that if we can at least just let one trusted person know what we're doing, Mm -hmm. then, then, then if something wants to happen to us, that there would always be, you know, some type of knowledge so that it could be able to help us worst case scenario. Well, and I think that that's a really good point is I think that that is one of many ways that prohibition and stigmatization really puts puts people at risk when they're really just trying to exercise bodily autonomy and choice, right? Because like I look at situations like that where people don't want to admit that they're on drugs or the fact that most of the time people have to go to, for lack of a better term, the streets to, to get their drugs and don't have access to testing equipment, don't have access. If, if, if there were programs out there that destigmatized it and allowed people to feel safe in exercising bodily autonomy, which is exactly what that is, you know, just like I'm free to eat craft dinner if I want to, I should be mm-hmm. free. You know, like, I mean, there's arguably a lot of the food that we're allowed to eat is much, much more toxic on an intermittent basis than than consuming pharma- pharmaceutical or non-pharmaceutical subs- substances. Even even alcohol, you know, alcohol is the one drug that if you quit cold turkey, you will die from. No mm-hmm. other drug is like that, you know, but that's the one that's legal, you know? <laughs> well, yeah, and I mean, the whole alcohol thing, I mean, I always, I look to that often because, I mean, it's a really, it's a really interesting point to me that not only is it the only one that will kill you, but it's also the most likely that I've seen. And I've known a lot of drug addicts having been, you know, I was addicted to crack when I was young and all that stuff. So it's the most likely from what I've seen to rapidly destroy relationships. Like it doesn't need to build into a years long addiction before people start hitting people or cussing people out or otherwise hurting people. Oh my God. Yes. And people aren't even like in a lot of places, like thankfully Canada, it's legal, but in a lot of places, even fucking pot is illegal, you know? And it's just like, that's so (laughs) insane to me that we will allow people to take something that is invariably dangerous. Maybe it's not always bad, like alcohol is not always bad, but it's invariably dangerous and refuse to let them fucking smoke the plant that grows in their backyard. Like it's, it's so crazy to me. Um, It it is ridiculous. And it's just, it's, it's really crazy because it's like us unwilling to do that really costs a lot of people, a lot of lives. You know what I mean? Because, uh, what happens is that these like alcoholics have to you know hide what they're doing just like you know other people except for when they hide what they're doing they they then decide to get behind the wheel of a car mm-hmm. you know they then be you know decide to you know uh you know go into an argument you know what i mean which you know really maybe they like shouldn't have and then they end up getting shot by a cop or something you know what i mean like and i think that if we could just like you're saying just like destigmatize um you know just you know doing drugs because it's it's crazy because they say that if you're from a certain part of the city that that like um, that your family will know to like tell you if you let's say you don't have that much energy, they'll be able to like send you over to a doctor to be able to get you like, let's say Adderall or something. Okay. But if you're from the other side of the track and like you have something, you know, like, you know, you would basically be getting, you know, methamphetamine, you know, and they are essentially the same exact thing. But of course, one is completely looked down upon while the other is, you know, called the study drug and is really celebrated in most, you know, really, you know, popular or and like really, you know, high up there colleges, you know, it just really is kind of very hypocritical. Absolutely. And I think that that's a, a point that's not often talked about is the social elements of these things is, you know, being someone who is... Like, I think that there's a lot of elements at play, but but wealth, I think, is a big one, is is being wealthy allows you to take those drugs without the stigma. Right, you know, absolutely. And, and, and also without as much danger, because when you look at methamphetamine versus, versus Adderall or um, Ritalin or any of those other amphetamine drugs, is Adderall, Ritalin, all of those are regulated. You know, they're they're tested and, and they're... They're regulated so that if you take the dose that you're recommended, you are not as likely to have serious side effects. Methamphetamine is not like that at all. You know, methamphetamine, you go out and hopefully it's actually meth. And if it is right. meth, you know, like 
that covers a wide array of chemical compositions. It, it, it's not one drug because people are making it in their bathtubs or in their houses with right. what they can find. So it's a little bit Absolutely. like MDMA versus ecstasy, right? Like MDMA is in ecstasy, but ecstasy mm. is a lot more than MDMA. Right, exactly. And, and sometimes, you know, these people don't know what they're doing when they make up these, you know, type of drugs. And there's been countless stories of people who have, you know, died from, you know. And now with fentanyl, you know, fentanyl is, is, is so strong that they've been using it to cut so many different things. And there's been, you know, crazy overdoses, you know. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I actually, so my, my cousin did a song about, about fentanyl and I did the animation for it. And I'm not going to lie, it was super intense because, I mean, I've lost people to fentanyl and it's a, it's, like I said, it's a really sad thing to me that from the way, way I see it, and, and maybe it's a little bit different on the other side of the border or whatever, but the only thing keeping fentanyl in the drugs that people are using is the fact that the government refuses to step in and do something about it. You know, like if they if they would step in and, you know, like we have dispensaries everywhere and those dispensaries require, a, they have an age limit and they have a certain <clears throat> level of education that the people who work at the dispensaries have to have about the products that they're selling. If we had something similar for, you know, what are called street drugs, not only would the government, you know, make a little bit of money off of it. And I mean, pot's not really that much more expensive from the government dispensaries here than it is from the street. The government will be able to make a little bit of money to put into programs to help people. And people could rest assured knowing that the the heroin that they're about to put in their veins isn't filled with fentanyl. Absolutely. Yeah. And just like how much more and like and like it would basically, you know, take a lot of the crime out of it all. And, you know, and like just like you said, there's really not a difference in price. But like, I'll tell you what, when I need weed, you know, let's say, you know, 10 years ago, um, I'd have to like, you know, literally go hang out with some scummy people, some like questionable situations to be able to get it, you know. And um, I think that if, you know, if like different other things were legal, that it, it would make it so that, you know, it would be a lot, um, a lot more safer for people and it would just be honestly i think a better overall experience for the whole world really well yeah and like one thing that i look at so i am a um a, a dabbler <laughs> i would say in herbal medicines and and uh the like so i make this 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 lotion this pain lotion that's it's got some thc and cbd in it and if i had access to something like cocaine that I could apply topically in on you know in a lotion, I would t- have to take less Tylenol, which is less bad for my liver, better overall. But like because people are living in fear, and and it really gets in the way of our happiness in in a big way because you it feels oppressive. It feels like the government is saying we don't trust you to take care of your own body. Right. Um, it's, it's just crazy how that is. Um, I gotta tell you a story because, um, this actually was like, this was like, this just happened uh, like just, just a couple weeks ago because I've been preaching this type of like way of life for probably about the last like, you know, year and a half or so. Um, but like to really see it work in, in my life was actually pretty scary, but it, it really was amazing though. But at first I just wasn't used to it. But, um, so I have, I have somebody really close to me who was telling me that they were going to have to check themselves into a mental institution because they were just you know not they were just feeling so depressed they were having to take care of their sick mother so i don't know if you've ever been around someone who has you know been like dying of cancer or something but Mm -hmm. it it really Mm -hmm. takes a lot out of you yeah so with all that on top of that they were on a substance called uh, vivance which is something that that the doctors were prescribing and Mm -hmm. um it is um it is uh, is essentially an amphetamine okay and um they all of a sudden took her off of it and they were making her basically fend for herself and they were saying, oh, no, well, we can't prescribe you this because your doctor's, um, you know, out on vacation. And, and like in, in the meantime, she's having a horrible time going through this. So, like, I think about it and like I'm just like, OK, amphetamine. I'm, I'm like, OK, what is, you know, what is something on the street that, you know, I could get this lady that can make her so that she could feel better, you know. And sure enough, you know, it was, you know, it was a, it was another type of, you know, accessible amphetamine. And sure mm-hmm. enough. The next day, just give her a little bit of it. The next day, I wake up, and this lady's literally singing in my 
in my living room, just her like her whole situation has changed. And at first I felt really bad after the fact, because I'm just like, Oh my God, when in this lady's whole life, nobody else would have ever given her this. And, you know, I had to give her this and like, I'm, I'm this piece of shit person. I always told myself that, um, <laughs> I would never let people try stuff with me for the first time. And like, you know, I haven't for years, but just with her, I did. But then, but then last time I saw her, she actually had everything together. She wasn't asking me for any more other substance. So it's like, wow, this whole way of thinking this safe substance use and, you know, being able to give people what they need can actually work. You know, it doesn't have to, you know, turn somebody into, uh, you know, a bag chaser or, you know, into, you know, the lowest common denominator in our society, you know, like it can work if we can just put the right, you know, systems um, around it. And, and of course, that narrative that we're telling ourselves about it as well. Well, and I think that that's really, to me, the biggest thing is, is like, you know, that story is very uplifting to me. Um, another drug that's commonly used off book for, for that type of thing is psilocybin. People microdose with psilocybin and acid all the time. And, and it's, it's very similar and it's a sad, sad thing that, uh, that we're stuck in this situation where people are, are feeling stigmatized, afraid to ask for help because, because, you know, doing a drug that's off book, off label, whatever is, is considered, like you said, to make someone the lowest common denominator. And I think, and that's what I felt too, you know, like that's, that's initially what I felt like afterwards, like, like for a minute there, um, I was just like really, really like just angry at myself because, but then I realized that that was just what society had told me. And it was so engraved in my, in my head about, you know, how I should feel about it. And, you know, but, but like all of it was wrong because that lady was like the living proof that, you know what, it does work if you, you know, if you don't do it, you know what I mean? Just like a certain type of way, you know? So I think that um, if, if, if the rest of the world could, you know, take away that narrative, I think that just like you said, quality of life would be so much more better for all of us in so many different ways. Well, yeah. And, and I mean, I, I'm going to go back to the hammer analogy. It's like, there are other tools that can sometimes fit that, that need or whatever, but imagine how fucking hard life would be without hammers. And it's true, people have been killed with hammers. It's it's not it's not a question. It's just that, like, you know, when you have a three-year-old that picks up a hammer, you you tell them, oh, no, no, maybe you're a little too young for that, or you teach them how to use it. And I think the same can be said for absolutely any other tool that we use. And so I, uh, yeah, like I said, I just appreciate, I appreciate talking to people who see it for the, shades of gray that it is because yeah addiction still exists and i don't think either of us are arguing that addiction exists and i think that we should take a moment to talk about you know what the people in charge really you know how they kind of approach it too because it's amazing because like recently um, i've been meeting a lot of nurses who are <laughs> who who like recreationally do um, different amphetamines and stuff but if you were to go to a doctor and like if you were to tell them that like let's say that you're doing a uh, meth or like heroin the way that they treat you is they 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 immediately almost discount everything that you say they act like you're not able to handle your own life basically and um who's not to say that sometimes they don't want to give you you know proper treatments because they're like oh well this person is just a drug addict anyway i don't know if you've ever been someone who has been, you know, on like a substance when you've had to go to the doctor, but it really is, uh, it's a really bad experience. Um, yeah, well, I haven't personally experienced, um, that kind of, I want to say, I want to say discrimination, but I'm not sure if it's the right word, but I haven't personally right. experienced that, but <clears throat> I know a lot of my peers who have been through recovery or actively using, and they have a problem and they're not, they're not treated. That's exactly, that's exactly right. And I don't, mm -hmm. I personally think that when it comes to doctors, I think one of the big reasons that doctors are the way that they are about drugs has more to do with fear of consequence than it does their own personal beliefs. It's we are taught this, this is the way we have to behave and operate. Because there's even like even in Canada, like we're not we're not as litigious and and quick to sue as our neighbors down south. But even then, doctors are a target if someone does get addicted, right? Or if someone does have poor interactions and stuff like that. And I think that we really need to step back and look at 
hey, you know what? Maybe doctors are people too. And maybe, you know, if a, if a patient really wants to try a, a, a drug or whatever it is because they think it'll help, give them the freedom to do that. Don't put it all on them, you know? Absolutely. I think that there's there's a lot of layers and it's all very, very mixed up. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Um, so, yeah. Um, before uh, Before we play our game... You mentioned in the beginning that you were a musician, and before we started talking, you told me about a song that you did that actually touches exactly on this topic. So, and I heard it, I liked it. So do you want to tell people a little bit more about where they can find you and stuff around you? And Yeah, so um, I I am really everywhere. You can check out my talk show, The Evans Explosion Show, um, on YouTube. If you just Google me, Evans Explosion, you'll be able to find my music. Um, I am releasing, um, a new song with uh, with Noisy Sauce. He is a producer from Australia called Pharmacy, and it definitely touches on this type of subject, really. And um, just a couple months ago, I, I also released a song called It's Not the Drugs, which was actually featured in Quarantine, which is a showcase of uh, LGBTQ music videos. And they oh. actually did a story on us in Paper Magazine, actually. And um, that exciting. song, It's Not the Drugs, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So um, check out my, my uh, so so check out the music video for that because that one really goes into more detail about you know that you know it's not the drugs you know so that's really cool and so most of your socials are going to be under Evans Explosion everything spelled pretty pretty much exactly how you'd expect exactly okay I just want to make sure that people are able to find you I'll also link you in the description do you have anything that you want to add before we move on to the game thank you so much for having me. Awesome. So are you ready to guess some Canadian slang? Let's do it. All right. So we're going to start nice and hopefully easy. What is Timmy's? I'm going to say shoes. <laughs> no, it's Tim Hortons, the coffee shop. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have any of those out here. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, I think, a few in New York, but otherwise there's pretty much none in, in America. Right. Um, <laughs> What about, do you know what a loony or a toony is? I'm going to say either a bathroom or a TV show. <laughs> <laughs> no, they are uh, one and two dollar coins. Hmm. All right. This is, this one's a bit on topic. Do you know what a two six is? I'm going to say a type of bong. <laughs> no, it's, um, I think you guys call it a handle, like 26 ounces of liquor. Huh. I think it's called a handle, right? In America? I, I quit drinking a lot of um a, a long time ago, so I'm not really sure, but possibly. Fair enough. I'm not a big drinker either. I just always find like it's so <laughs> interesting how uh how different they are. You know, it's funny because I'm so anti -pro prohibitionist, but besides smoking weed for medicinal purposes, I don't really like drugs. I just hate that they're prohibited for medicinal use. Uh, <laughs> do you know what it means to give her? Um uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it means to like, like do your best, try your hardest, like, or like, just like really go at something. So like, if I was shoveling my, my driveway, someone might look outside and be like, she's just fucking giving her. That's, that's how that would be used. <laughs> um, and then we will finish off with one that I'm sure you've heard before. Cause it's not unique to Canada, but I know America doesn't use it. What is Zed? I want to say the music producer, but I don't know any other way that it's used. So. <laughs> it's the, uh, the last letter of the alphabet. So it's X, Y, Z. Mm, nice. Yeah. Thank you so much for playing. And thank you so much for, for this conversation. I had so much fun. Honestly, I wish that I wish that there were more opportunities to, to talk about this because I am super passionate about autonomy and freedom, um, you know, personal freedoms. So I really appreciate it. And I hope that people go find you because your music is good. And <clears throat> sorry, guys, your music is good. And, uh, and you have a lot of interesting and insightful things to say. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And to my listeners, I love you. Bye.